is, is living humbly. And we are not going to deal with David and Bathsheba because I've spent enough time on David. But I do want you to know that there's nothing like having lots and then taking more. That's not how we live humbly. So from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 24 uh, to 35, I'm going to kind of read it in pieces. The Gospel of John says, So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, and Jesus had just finished teaching and feeding them lots of bread uh, and fish, they themselves, that's the crowd, got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Verily, truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of all that bread that I gave you. Do not this is really important. Not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures eternal life. Working for the food that produces eternal life, that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Now the crowds ask this kind of strange question. And they say, what must we do to perform the works of of God. Odd question in some ways. Jesus answered, This is the work of God, that you believe in Him who He has sent. <clears throat> Basically, what Jesus is saying is that your work is all about belief. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. Now, if you were a Pharisee or Sadducee in that crowd, you would have mighty have had. If you were a person who was loyal to the law, this would have been very upsetting. You know, it wasn't that manna in the wilderness, it wasn't that one or two day old bread <clears throat> that perishes and causes other kinds of problems that you want. It's the true bread from heaven. Very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it was my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of heaven is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And of course they said to him, Sir, give us this bread. It is summertime. Is it not? We all know that from being here in Tucson. It's warm in here. I see Tatiana panning there. So. <laughs> I don't blame you. I do the same thing. For those of you who have been to Zion National Park in Utah, you know, you know the magnificent scenery that God has created in that place. How many of you have been to Zion? Just told me. Whoa! Wow! Okay, so you know that that is an inverted Grand Canyon, kind of. When you go to the north and south rims of the Grand Canyon, you live, for the most part, unless you're at Fen Ranch, you live up top. The motels, the lodgings, the camping, all of that is up on the top rim, not so at Zion. At Zion, you go down in, and you kind of camp, and you lodge, and you stay down in the canyon, and you're looking out most of the time. Nature trails take you to areas that are beautiful, pristine. You maybe have gone on a trail that strolls along and starts to go up where the rocks are damp, and the water kind of ekes out from the little cracks in there, and these beautiful random flowers, tiny little things, grow out from the sides of the cliff and they're watered as if almost hyperponically. And, and then you go further up and you see a couple of little waterfalls 
that spill over and you feel as if somehow you are in the Garden of Eden as you stroll up along this trail. There is no question about it. putting in a little plug for our national park system. Our national park system in America is a unique jewel. Yes, it has its politics, but it is a unique jewel and a feast for the eyes. Yes, there are fires caused often by that species called human. Yes, there are crowds in the summer, sometimes unbearable. And yes, the park animals seem far more domesticated. I have often thought, Jerry and I have often said, that the Fred Harvey Corporation has hired the elk and the squirrel to come in in the early morning hours, punch a time card, and then go out into the public view of everyone who's there. Oh, don't they look so cute, little knowing that they're on their clock. As you drive west from Zion by about 35 miles, you get to a town called St. George, Utah, which is where our story begins today. Some years ago, in the early 1950s, on a breezy, sunny day in St. George, Utah, a young boy of eight years old was playing on a swing in his backyard. He was laughing, he was having a great time. Folks, life was good. Those were the, the, the good old days. America was on the move. World War II was about eight years behind us. America's future was bright. Disneyland had just gotten underway, and for all the women in the audience, oh, your life would have been so much better. You go to Tomorrowland and you see this round carousel, and you go inside and all the new vacuum cleaners and the new uh, washing machines and the dryers, and all those new products were on display. America was on the move. Children, remember children rode their Schwinn bicycles and there were little kind of, uh, oh gosh, like little streamers tied to the handlebars of the bikes. And on rare occasions, kids delighted in, in uh, you know, riding behind that wonderful wet spray of pesticides, you know those trucks that would spray out the pesticides. And the kids would ride in the stream of that, and you just get all nice and misty and moist from those pesticides. We learned how to duck and cover, did we not? We duck and cover. And if you get under your school desk just right, you get under there just right, you're probably going to be able to avoid an atomic bomb attack with all of its blast and radiation to kind of pass you by. And then in the promotion films, well, if you're a young man and you're escorting a young girl out of the school and you don't have your, your school books stuck underneath you, right? You're walking along and all of a sudden you have an atomic bomb alert. It's imminent. What do you do? Well, you take that girl, you drag her over to the side of the building and you cover her because that is going to keep her from getting all that radiation and from all that blast. I'm sure some other guys might have liked to have done something like that, but that's a whole different type of subject, not a bomb. The young boy in St. George, Utah, he swings back and forth on his swing in 1953. It's a true story. The young boy swinging back and forth in 1953 in his backyard, and there is a Geiger counter in front of him that is relentless in its clicking. It clicks away furiously in front of him, measuring levels of radiation almost 1,000 times greater than any place or city in the nation. We were indeed on the move. You see, just days before, a new bomb had been tested on the other side of the border. This bomb being three times the force 
of the one used in Hiroshima or Nagasaki eight years earlier. I know some of you pronounce Hiroshima, Hiroshima, whichever way you choose to pronounce it. But this boy, along with the residents of that town in that area, were called what? They were called downwinders. What were downwinders? Downwinders was the new name for citizen who received off the chart radiation levels from an atom bomb test. Now the word atomic had just come into our vocabulary. Even though that word was invented and used in 1903 by one man, 1903, it didn't come into our vocabulary until all of a sudden we heard about atomic bomb. We were so naive. Who could have known that we, as God's people, walking humbly with our Lord, would end up crossing the line where we were able to destroy humanity and the planet that God had created? And that possibility was now born. You can't really see an atom, this the smallest constituent unit of ordinary matter that has properties as the properties of a chemical element. Each one is composed of a nucleus and one or more electrons are bound to that nucleus. Like the mustard seed of the Bible, except infinitely smaller, it has so much potential. As some of you may have seen on PBS this last week, we are observing the 70th anniversary of the atomic bomb. This thing, this widget, as it was called, capable of obliterating a city. I am not here today to debate or talk about the ethics of dropping a bomb on Japan in World War II. That's a whole other subject for another day. I am here to say, whether we like it or not, that humanity now had the seedling to take away that which God had created. Walking humbly with our Lord had changed and has changed, for we could no longer reset the clock. So we move forward, did we not? America was on the move. We created and we innovated. We continued our quest to solve the unsolvable. Albert Einstein's theory of special relativity discovered that the increased relativistic mass, M, of a body comes from the energy of motion of the body. That is, its kinetic energy, E, divided by the speed of light, C squared. Thus, E equals MC squared. Right? Easy enough. Progress continues. The atomic bomb that had exploded over Hiroshima contained the energy of 20,000 tons of TNT. It's a lot. Right? That was a lot. Mere child's play. Mere child's play. Living humbly? Mm -hmm. Not to be outdone, we entered an age, a new age of thermonuclear capability, and in time, Russia would test and detonate a thing called the what? The Tsar Bomb. T S A R B O M B A. The Tsar Bomb. It is a nuclear bomb. Tested not terribly long after 1953, I think it was around 1961, 62. It had and contained the force, not 20,000 tons of TNT, 50 million tons of TNT, 50 million tons of TNT. I can guarantee you, having been in the Air Force, uh, overseas, we have matched that and exceeded that. Putting it in perspective, we are now told, we now have the knowledge that we have a capability of that atomic bomb 4,000 times more explosive, 4,000 times more explosive than the one that went off in Japan. As a society, most people were and still are blissfully unaware of these developments. We learned centuries ago, did we not, that the Earth really wasn't flat after all. The Earth 
was ground and there was this thing called gravity that, that held it together. And we know that astronomy was part of the Persian and the Egyptian and the Babylonian empires and so many other civilizations. In our lifetime, we've seen people bouncing around on the moon. And we saw this, this, this little thing called a rover that, that was pinpoint landed on Mars. But can you imagine that? Yet we still know, do we not, John, very little about dark energy. We don't really know the shape of the universe, or no one really has solved the Fermi paradox. However, we do know that an astronomer by the name of John Hill has been part of the team that has helped us and all of humanity to see further into space than anyone in human history could have ever dreamed of. That is a miraculous achievement. Mathematics, of course you've all seen the pictures of Little House of the Prairie and the other Prairie and Pioneer Tech programs and teachers writing math and chalkboard on the wall. They did that when I was in school too. They wrote on chalkboards but all of a sudden, something came along like equations and concepts and theorems that most people will never fathom. And they are advancing at a mind-blowing rate. The Clay Mathematics Institute, at the turn of the millennium, put out a bounty of $1 million on the heads of seven unsolved, unsolved mathematical problems. Now, one of them has already been solved, so you're out of luck. Gone, there's six more to go. One of them has to do with the finiteness of ranking of elliptical curves and regular curves. And if you can do things like that, if you can work with that, you may be the first to solve something called the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture. You'll save a million dollars, but you've got to be the first to solve it. Plato. Aristotle, Socrates, Euclid, Archimedes, Da Vinci, Rembrandt, Thomas Aquinas, Martin Luther, Van Carey, Thomas Edison, Robert Oppenheimer, 37-year-old Rosalind Franklin who worked with DNA and its molecular structures, MRIs, organ transplants, cloning. The list of discoverers, the list of discoveries go on and on and on. And in this 11th hour of humanity, they are accelerating as fast as the collider over in Europe. Look, I took five years of Latin, and I took years of philosophy and statistics, but there aren't any dead Romans that I can talk to. I can look at a book, but I can't speak to them. I can talk about if X, then Y, and Z. I can quote utilitarian principles. I can talk about Plato's theory of forms. I can, I can talk about Aristotle's eudaimonia concept out of the Nicomachean ethics, his idea of happiness. So what? So what? If I cannot evangelize one single person, if I lose my faith because I think that there is no God, if I'm unwilling to proclaim Christ as Lord and Savior, then these things that I've learned are so much rubble on a trash heap. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels but don't have love, I'm simply a noisy, irritating gong or an off-tune symbol. If I have faith, but not love, I'm nothing. I'm absolutely zip zero, not a nothing. What will it take? What works must I do in the eyes of God? Ask yourself, how in the world do we, how do we in the world walk humbly with our Lord when we have discovered so much more than the world could have ever, ever possibly dreamed of. How do we believe there is a God in the face of such mind-numbing 
discoveries and conversely in the face of such horrific potential for nuclear destruction of the entire planet. What does it mean to talk about Jesus Christ and the dusty paths to Jerusalem or the Son of God or the Kingdom of God and in the same breath say that the laws of physics are the same for all non-accelerating observers? What does it mean to say believe when we know that today, we know this for a fact, we know today that hundreds, hundreds of thermonuclear weapons can reach the United States in 33 minutes. 33 minutes, folks, that's all it takes for hundreds of thermonuclear weapons to come and absolutely obliterate this area that we call the United States, not to mention everything north and south of us. 33 minutes, the age when the Son of God was crucified. How do we live by faith? What must we do? One of our lectionary texts today, although we did not read it, comes from Ephesians chapter 4, where the Apostle Paul says, I therefore, as a prisoner in the Lord, Beg you, I beg you to be a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And how do you lead it? Catch this. How do you lead that life? With all humility and gentleness. I've got to tell you, I think humanity, much of it, is way past humility in this age of technology. Hear then the timeless words from the prophet Micah. With what shall I come before the Lord? Should I come before the Lord with burnt offerings? No. Here's what Micah says. He has told you, O mortal, what is good. He has told you what is good. And what is good is to do justice, to love kindness, and what? To walk humbly, with your Lord. Walk humbly with your God. I'll tell you a story in closing here. Early in my ministry, I met one of my first mentors. His name was John. His wife's name was Phyllis. He was a really slender slip of a man. I mean, he was probably five foot four, five foot five. Maybe he weighed 120, maybe 130 pounds dripping wet. He was a teacher. You could tell that because his bearing was that of an intellect. But he was most humble. He was most gracious. He was most kind. He was most compassionate. And he had a horribly wicked sense of humor. I was his pastor for some years out in Hollywood. And while we talked about theology and life, we also talked about his struggle with his two adult children who were giving him and his wife absolute fits. They were a challenge, to put it mildly. I spent a lot of time in their home. Later, I learned about this man who helped to shape me professionally and mold me in ways that I would have never dreamed of. His name, by the way, if you want to Google search it, is Dr. John Albert Russell. Dr. Russell was the founder of the astronomy department at the University of Southern California, USC. He founded it. He chaired that department for almost 25 years. He was the associate dean of physical sciences and mathematics for years. His lectures were televised nationally on CBS. For several years. Upon retirement, he continued to receive numerous academic awards. So, so, why do you need to know about Dr. John Russell? Well, because one day we stood out on Hollywood Boulevard. We were the only Protestant church out on Hollywood Boulevard. And we stood out there and we faced this beautiful edifice. And we looked at it, and all of a sudden, just out of nowhere, I said, John, you have discovered so many amazing things. You have looked 
in areas where no ordinary person will ever look. How is it that you believe in God? And John you know, gets his big smile. This tiny little guy gets his big smile. He shrugs his shoulders. He looks at me and says, well, God, I'm pretty ordinary, I think. But I've had the chance to see a bit more of God's creation than some. I just know it's God. That's the brilliant answer from this brilliant guy. He says, I just know it's God. I mean, how many of you in this room dabble in the science area? How many of you are mathematicians and scientists and chemists and, and teachers and, and, and God knows what, receptionists, whoever you are? John had a gift, and his gift was humility, and his gift was kindness and graciousness and love and compassion. I have never met a more humble, gracious man. He passed into life eternal in 2003, and he left behind that legacy of walking humbly with our Lord. See, I can see John. I can see John, and I can see an innocent, innocent boy of eight years old on that swing set in St. George, Utah. I can see the poor, and I can see the innocent, and I can see the broken, and I can see the brilliant, and I can see the geniuses of our world, and I can see the tormented, and the oppressed, the victims and the slaves and the ordinary. I can see them all walking with Jesus on a dusty road in the direction of heaven. One of that group says, Teacher, what, what, what must we do to perform the works of God? And Jesus says, Believe? Because that's a word. It's a verb, I guess. If I have that right, I'm not smart enough to know that, but it sounds like a verb to me. The works of God. What are the works of God? Believe. That's what Jesus says. Believe in Him whom He has sent. So brothers and sisters, today in 2015, in this era where we are 33 minutes from obliteration, where we are seconds from God, Believe in Jesus Christ. Believe in Jesus. Do justice. That's how you live humbly. Do justice. Love kindness.